welcome everyone to what is the penultimate uh, ECR seminar for this year. Um, today we'll have Kate Story Fisher from uh, New York University uh, giving a talk on the emulation of summary statistics for cosmology from galaxy surveys. So uh, Kate, take it away. Thank you and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so as well said, my name is Kate Story Fisher. I'm a PhD candidate at New York University. Um, I'm currently in Brooklyn and I'm also a NASA Finest Fellow, Future Investigators in Earth and Space Science Technology. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, be here tonight. So, uh, well, tonight for me, good morning to you all. Um, feel free to, during the talk, to um, interrupt me with questions. I'm happy to have it be uh, more of a discussion. Um, and also feel free to use the chat. I'll be um, checking it during the talk. Um, all right, I'll get started. Um, so before I get into emulation, I wanted to just um, do a bit of an overview of uh, my research program um, because I, I work on a variety of things. Um, so the, the connecting thread is I work on statistical and data science methods for uh, galaxies and large scale structure. Um, and so one of the axes um, of my work is making um, improved cosmological measurements. Uh, so one of my first project along these lines was um, generalizing the classic um, two point function estimator um, for the correlation function. Um, and uh, we're that's kind of the project that I, uh, I mentioned we're using to uh, look for gradients in the large scale structure. Um, more recently, I've been working on um, preserving symmetries in machine learning methods for um, large scale structure analyses. So uh, using uh, making sure we're using um, uh, methods that are equivariant to uh, changes to transformations, so to rotations, translations, things like that. Um, so that's uh, continuing work. Um, and this project will be on um, emulation of cluster statistics. I'll get into that more. Um, and then I'll also be working on um, or I've also been working on um, the axis of detecting weirdness in data. Um, so uh, David mentioned the project uh, I have been working on, on detecting um, anomalous galaxies with uh, GANs, um, generative adversarial networks. Um, but I'm also interested in um, what it means to find anomalies in large scale structure data. So that's also ongoing work. Um, all right, um, so now let's get into the emulation side. Um, so, I'm gonna do a kind of a very a small bit of background because I know we all work on kind of different parts of cosmology, um, but I'm sure you're, you're mostly familiar um, with these first couple slides. Um, but when we um, want to extract cosmological information from uh, the large scale structure, we use uh, galaxy surveys. So on the left, I'm showing um, the BOSS and SDSS um, spectroscopic galaxies. Um, so the yellow is the uh, main SDSS main sample. Um, the uh, White are um, the the extended um, SDSS LRGs, and then the the red is the BOSS sample. Um, we might even have more than that now. Um, and uh, the way we um, extract information, which is contained in the uh, clustering patterns of these galaxies, um, is using cosmological simulations. So on the right, I'm showing um, a snapshot from the Millennium Cosmological Simulation, and you can see similar. Um, cosmic web-like structure in both of the data and the, uh, the simulations. Um, and so what we want to do is perform inference um, on the simulations to figure out what um, uh, the cosmological parameters are um, and potential deviations from our cosmological model in the observations. Um, okay, so how do we go about doing this? Um, the issue is that uh, this cosmological data is too high dimensional to totally forward model, so far at least. Um, so instead of trying to match all the data points, we try to match summary statistics between the two. Um, and so here I'm showing just a very simple uh, plot, the monopole of the correlation function, uh, C0. And um, you can see it's, it's nearly a power law. Um, and it's the um, Fourier transform of the power spectrum, as you probably know. Um, and this is informative about um, a variety of uh, cosmological statistics. Um, so on the left, I'm showing um, gamma f. In the middle, we have sigma, uh, sorry, omega m, our um, matter density. And on the right, we have omega, uh, sigma 8, the um, amplitude of uh, fluctuations. Um, and so you can see here that as we vary these parameters, uh, we get um, differences uh, relative to the mean of our monopole. So you can see how we then might be able to, with a bunch of co uh, cosmological simulations at a variety of um, sets of cosmological parameters, we could figure out which 
um, statistic most closely matches that that we measure on our data um, and figure out the cosmological parameters like that. Um, the issue is that these simulations are really expensive to run. Um, and so that is where the Amulus project comes in. Um, the other kind of access for this project is we're focusing on small scales because there's a lot of extra um, cosmological information at small scales that hasn't kind of been used for um, some of these main cosmological measurements so far. Um, so here's a, an image of one of the Amula simulations. Um, they are large um, end body simulations. There's um, 75 of them. I'll get into some details later. Um, all of the citations are over here and uh, many collaborators in particular, Jeremy Tinker at NYU um, who I'm working with and Risa Wexler at Stanford. Um, so the issue, is, as I said, is that these simulations are really expensive. We can't you know, run um, a whole simulation and all these different sets of models and compare to data. Um, so what we need to do is use um, a sparse, um, but kind of well sampled set of high resolution and body simulations. Um, and then we use an emulation approach uh, to um, kind of interpolate between the simulations and um, apply the emulator instead of directly the simulations to infer the cosmological parameters from data. So I will get into more details of how we do this. Um, but the overall approach is we first generate these um, amula simulations, as I mentioned, to span our kind of assumed prior space. And then we compute our set of summary statistics, um, which will be kind of end up being the main focus of this talk, um, to, to build up our training set. Um, for our emulator, we use a Gaussian process um, because they're really flexible, um, but generally well-behaved models um, that can learn these correlations and make predictions. Um, and then we use uh, standard MCMC um, on our test simulations uh, to see how well we recover the true parameters. So all of this is all on our, on our simulation so far, um, just to, to see how this approach works. Uh, so a little more detail on the simulations. Um, so they span um, the parameter space with a seven dimensional cosmological model. Um, five of them are, are shown in the plot here. And then we have a couple more. Um, as well as an 11 dimensional HOD model, um, which I'll describe more in a, in a second. Um, and we also include um, assembly bias, which I will also explain more. Um, and so we have a decent mass resolution for these simulations. They're pretty high resolution um, and they're over a gigaparsec on uh, each side. Um, and we have um, 40 cosmologies in our training set. So those are the, um, I hope you guys can see my mouse. These are uh, the black points in this space. And then the test set um, is seven cosmologies in this space. You can see where um, uh, we use kind of the, the known uh, degeneracies. So we uh, um, sample the space that we're already more likely to be in. Um, and we also uh, run um, uh, many different HODs on each of these to, to better sample our parameter, parameter space. So we end up with 4,000 training catalogs and 700 test catalogs. Okay, so a little bit more on um, halo occupation distribution and assembly bias. Um, so once we have these cosmological simulations, as I said, these are n-body simulations, so they're dark matter only. Um, in order to compare to our data, we only see galaxies in the data, so we have to um, populate our dark matter only simulations with galaxies. Um, so we start with our dark matter halos, and we um, have to figure out um, which uh, halos of which size um, host uh, galaxies at all, and then um, which of those host additional satellite galaxies. Um, and so the way we do this is called the halo occupation distribution, which is um, quite a successful uh, method that's been in use for the last couple of decades. Um, and uh, on the right shows kind of how it works. So basically um, it's a formula for uh, or a model for telling us um, how many galaxies uh, live in each dark matter halo as a function of the halo mass on the uh, x-axis here. Um, and so the centrals are in the red. Um, so above a certain mass, you, you typically have um, a central galaxy um, and then uh, satellites uh, follow a power law. Um, and so then you're able to, to get a, have a probabilistic model of um, halos and galaxies. Um, we also add assembly bias, um, which is the dependence on properties, uh, dependence of the number of galaxies per halo on, the, on properties besides just the halo mass. So um, in our uh, assembly bias model, we um, care about the local environment. So uh, we compute the local density um, in terms of the number density around each galaxy um, and add um, uh, another term um, to our model that uh, is based on this environment because we know that 
um, there's been work showing that assembly bias does have perhaps have some effect on um, the final clustering. Um, and so all of this um, is important for being able to do this at all, but we actually don't really care about these parameters at the end of, end of the day. Um, we might care a little bit about assembly bias to understand uh, the galaxy halo connection a bit, um, but generally we marginalize over these parameters to end up with our final cosmological parameters. All right. Um, so the, typically how this is done is we take some standard summary statistics. So these are going to be the two point functions we were all discussing earlier. Um, so all the way on the left, we have the projected correlation function, um, which is uh, the correlation function um, as a function of just the um, RP, the, the projected radius, which is summed over the line of sight um, direction, pi. Um, and that's usually what's um, you know, commonly measured in our um, real data, it's the easiest to measure. Um, in the middle, we also measure the, the monopole of the correlation function. Um, this is all in redshift space, let me mention, because where we want to um, be sensitive to redshift space assortions, that's where a lot of our information is coming from. Um, and we also have the quadrupole of the correlation function, which is more poorly measured, but also contains important information when combined with the monopole. Um, so these are very simple plots, but so we're all on the same page about the standard statistics that we use. Um, all right, so then uh, how do we uh, build up our emulators? Um, we use uh, Gaussian processes, as I mentioned, um, which are very flexible, um, infinite dimensional, in a sense, models um, that fit our data. Um, and we constrain it with a, a kernel. Um, this is you know, something we have to do some hyperparameter tuning to figure out uh, what Gaussian process kernel we should use. Um, but we uh, kind of make, a, make some educated choices around that. Um, and then we are able to um, input all of our uh, training set statistics. So here it's going to be um, for each emulator, we train, sorry, we train a separate emulator for each of the um, cosmological parameters. Um, so we'll take all 4,000 of the, uh, for example, monopole measurements um, for our amulus catalogs, um, input them into um, the Gaussian process along with the associated training set parameters. So this is some sampling I've cut out here of all the um, cosmological and HND parameters. Um, and use them to train the Gaussian process emulator. Um, and then we uh, test um, how our emulator did uh, using the um, 700 test simulations. So we, sorry, um, we are able to then use the trained Gaussian process emulator to make predictions um, for the cosmological parameters. Um, so I'm happy to answer yeah, more detailed questions about the Gaussian process emulator, but um, that's the overview. Um, and so here's how we do. So for these three standard statistics, um, the top of each plot shows in the um, uh, circles, we have the uh, observation on mock data. The lines show the prediction of the emulator. So they're kind of all overlapping, but you can see generally the ones of light colors, you know, go through each other. Um, so we're, oops, sorry. Um, we're predicting well. Um, and on the Middle plot, we show the fractional error um, between the mock and the emulator prediction. So, you know, we have a span of about 10% um, overall. Um, on the bottom, we have um, kind of this overall error. So it's um, some, it's the inner 68% of the fractional errors uh, in black here. And we compare that to the sample variance to, to get a handle on, on how well we're doing compared to how well we're measuring these in the first place. Um, so the uh, the outer blue is kind of the original sample variance, but you can see we're actually doing a little better in our emulator than sample variance. And that's possible because um, I'm actually showing you measurements um, that are on the um, average of the five, we have five test boxes per cosmology. So for the training sample, we only have one um, test box per cosmology, but um, for test testing to get a better handle on our accuracy, we have um, five per cosmology. So uh, that we have to compare to the um, darker blue to, to account for the fact that we're actually comparing to this mean. Um, so we're, we're not quite beating sample variance in that sense, but we're doing pretty good compared to it. Um, and you can see similarly for the monopole, um, we, uh, we do quite well. We're um, under 5% under overall, some close to 2% um, predictions. Uh, and for the quadrupole, um, as I said, it's uh, more poorly measured. So we're, we're closer to the 10% range, but still um, getting some useful information. And the different colors here um, are, well, each line is a different mock and then each of the colors are different cosmologies. Um, and you can see an interesting pattern, um, which is that the, the cosmologies cluster in 
um, their, their error, which is kind of showing how that information um, is encoded in these summary statistics. So over here, you can see that um, whatever this cosmology is, it um, uh, has a, a lower uh, WP compared to, or sorry, a lower um, fractional error generally compared to um, the, the mean. So um, you can already start to see some patterns. All right. Um, so this is um, work from um, one of my collaborators that's um, still in progress um, that I'm a uh, co-author on. Um, and so this is with these three standard um, emulators. Uh, we um, did a fit to the BOSS data. Um, and this is, I'm just showing the smallest redshift bin. We did this in three different redshift bins, but we also have this for the higher redshifts. So the um, black squares are the BOSS measurements of each of the summary statistics. And the um, lines, you can just focus on the blue line is the, the emulator um, uh, aided fit to the BOSS data. So you can see we're um, you know, fitting it quite well with our emulator um, down to, this is a few, a uh, couple percent. Um, and so the punchline is with that, we're able to constrain the cosmological parameters from the actual BOSS measurements. Um, so this is a plot of um, many uh, measurements of F sigma eight, the growth of structure parameter, which is really important because it can distinguish between different um, dark energy as well as modified gravity models. Um, and there's also some kind of disagreements in the literature. So kind of adding adding more points to this graph at different redshifts is, is quite important. Um, so all these colorful ones are from uh, prior measurements. You might recognize some of these papers. Um, and then our new measurements are um, in the um, in the blue is the ones to focus on as the fiducial ones. Um, and you can see we're uh, low on F sigma eight for um, all of uh, all of the redshift uh, slices that we work on. Um, so uh, this paper has a long discussion of, of why we think that might be. I won't get into it here, but um, basically we, um, and this is, you know, to quite high precision. So um, we wanted to kind of continue this work um, with uh, kind of a more, an extensive um, treatment of um, this emulation method to, to confirm this, as well as um, include other statistics to see how this um, will compare. So I will um, move on to kind of the, um, next part of the talk, talking about beyond standard summary statistics, but I wanted to pause here and see if there are any questions. All right, I'll continue, but um, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, okay, so in order to continue this work, um, I wanted to look at summary statistics beyond kind of the standard two point ones that we um, often use. Um, so uh, some that have been shown to be particularly um, informative in the literature are the under density probability function. Um, so just a, a brief explanation of it is um, if I have a simulation um, in three dimensions with uh, populated with galaxies, I can throw down um, randomly placed spheres and um, count up the density in each sphere and compare that to um, some threshold, so some fraction of the mean density. Um, and so I'm plotting here as a function of the size of the sphere. So for small spheres, um, what percent are um, uh, have a number density that's less than this threshold? Um, so at very small um, scales, we're going to have you know very few galaxies in each little circle. It's a lot of a lot of empty space. So we're going to have more under densities. Um, and down at large scales. Um, we're going to have higher densities compared to the mean, so we'll have um, a, a smaller uh, UPF under density probability function. Um, and this has been kind of shown to um, break some degeneracies in the literature, so we wanted to explore it. And then um, on the right, I'm showing the marked correlation function, um, which is just the uh, regular correlation function, but we weight the galaxy pairs um, in addition to waiting for all the systematics that we discussed um, by the, the local density. So um, the the density here within a sphere of 10 megaparsecs uh, per H. Um, and so it has this, this kind of interesting shape um, and you can understand this in terms of um, kind of what the uh, what neighborhoods the galaxies are hanging out in at different scales. Um, so at quite small scales, you have um, cluster galaxies that tend to have um, a, a fairly high local density. Um, and then once you get out into certain larger scales, you're going to be probing galaxy pairs that are kind of between uh, maybe a cluster galaxy and an isolated galaxy or two isolated galaxies. So that'll be 
um, have a lower uh, March correlation function. And then as you go to larger scales, you're back to kind of probing the mean density. You might be grabbing, you know, pairs and clusters. So it gets um, larger again. Um, I have a question in the chat. So for the non-standard summer statistics, is there a natural way to include the alcock pachinski effect? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's definitely not as straightforward as in the standard, um, like a monopole and, and quadrupole. Um, so I think it would take some work to include um, the AP effect, but, um, and so we haven't, yeah, we haven't done that here, but I'm not sure if um, that's been done in the literature. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, okay, great. Um, but yeah, good idea, I'll follow up on that. Um, so yeah, this is just the details of the marked correlation function. It's um, uh, we we get to choose what mark we we use, um, and so we we played around with the exact form of um, of the the weighting uh, by the local density, um, and we kind of chose something that was that balanced the uh, um, kind of how much it changed across our our test sample um, to be you know not wildly fluctuating, um, but also not like too well constrained that it's not informative. Um, all right, so now we have a couple of these beyond standard statistics um, and we do the same procedure. We um, construct Gaussian process emulators. Um, so actually all the plots I showed you before of the standard ones, those were also my emulators for this, um, different emulators, kind of updated emulators than what were used for the, the BOSS data analysis I showed you, just to clarify. Um, but we also uh, get really good results for our um, uh, UPF and uh, M of R emulators. Um, so for the UPF, it's actually super well constrained at small scales, but that's because it's not particularly interesting because you know barely any mocks have um, uh, you know high density areas at small scales. Um, so we have you know way less than one percent error, but still well constrained up to um, around forty five. And note that we use a linear scale here because it's not particularly interesting if we if we use a log scale for the UPF. Um, and then for the marked correlation function. Um, we have similar error that we find um, actually even better than the, the regular monopole, which is interesting. Um, all right. Um, and so a little um, explanation for kind of why we're using some of these statistics. Um, so this is kind of a similar plot to the one I showed you early on about how the uh, monopole changes with respect to certain cosmological parameters. But here on the left of each of these, I'm showing um, WP. Uh, and on the right, I'm showing the UPF um, with respect to different cosmological parameters. So this one is um, omega m, the matter density, um, and you can see um, how exactly the um, uh, statistic is sensitive to um, omega m. And I could I could talk through exactly you know why it's greater here and less here, but that kind of details here. We just know it's informative for for our parameter recovery, um, and we see that the UPF. Um, is is actually quite informative as well, particularly at these kind of intermediate to to large scales. Um, but it turns out even at the small scales, it's informative as well. Um, and then, so these are um, cosmological parameters on the left here. On the right, we have an HOD parameter, um, the mass uh, the mass cutoff for satellites from that diagram I showed you earlier, as well as one of these assembly bias parameters, the um, uh, environmental kind of one of the parameters that controls the dependence on environment. Um, and you can see that the, U, the um, UPF is particularly sensitive to this parameter, even more so than WP. So that uh, bodes well for our emulators. Okay, um, so before we go into um, being able to do recovery tests on these, we need to get our covariance matrices down. And this ends up being you know, a, bit of a, a bit of a headache as some of you might be familiar with. Um, so on the left here, I have the uh, um, kind of full covariance matrix for all five of our statistics. Um, so the ones along the diagonal are going to be the individual covariances um, between the bins. So we use nine bins for each one. Um, and then we have also the cross um, correlations between all the statistics. Um, and so this is for the um, kind of overall sample variance in the amulet simulations. Um, you can see, you know, already some patterns with uh, positive correlations between most statistics, but then the marked correlation function has negative correlation, interestingly. Um, and then the middle plot shows the um, emulator performance covariance matrix. So the, um, like how well the emulator is making its predictions in each bin um, ends up being correlated with nearby bins. Um, and uh, it's actually not very correlated with the, the quadruple, interestingly. 
Um, but you can see that this is uh, pretty noisy. And so it was causing some issues with our uh, parameter recovery. Um, so we did a technique that's uh, been used previously in the literature, which is to perform a basic smoothing on this. So we just do a Gaussian smoothing on this covariance matrix. And that's shown here. You can kind of see how this is pixelated, smoothed out version of this. Um, and then we're able to get kind of more well-behaved parameter recovery while still having the general um, you know, correct correlation structure. All right. Um, so finally, some results with these. Um, so in the, these are contour plots of on the left, we have, oh, I switched some of these around, sorry. In the middle, we have cosmological parameters. On the left, we have HOD parameters. Um, on the right, we have assembly bias parameters. Um, and in the gray, we have the prior that we use. Um, and so the prior for uh, the HOD is just um, the bounds of our um, training set. And then, well, a little bit you know, beyond that with a buffer. And then for the um, cosmology, we know there's a lot of degeneracies and we wanna make sure we kind of stay in, in the broadly expected space. So we use a high dimensional ellipsoid for our prior. Um, and then I'm showing in blue, um, if we add it, if we use um, WP of RP, um, only that statistic for our uh, recovery tests, um, you can see that we um, improve our cosmology constraints pretty significantly over the prior, that's good. And then also for HOD and assembly bias, we get um, significant improvement. Um, but we wanna see what happens with all these other statistics. So that's what we do. Um, here I have the correct ordering of the statistics. Um, so now I'm showing you um, taking in the individual statistics by themselves for um, the five statistics I've been discussing. So on the left, we have the co uh, three cosmological parameters we're interested in. Um, so I should say that we run these chains with, with the full 18 dimensional parameters and I'm just showing you a subset um, of the constraints here. So we have um, uh, omega M, sigma A and gamma F. Um, and you can already see that um, kind of all of the, the statistics individually are able to bring in constraining power, mostly. Um, some more accurately and precisely than others, but um, it, it bodes well that they're all doing better than the prior. Um, HOD parameters, uh, similarly, um, and in particular, uh, we can see that the marked correlation function is like adding in um, uh, constraining power over WP. And for assembly bias, um, we can see that the quadrupole is really not helping us out much, but the others um, do seem to be. And it's actually interesting that even WP and, and some of the standard ones are helping us out to constrain assembly bias. So that's something that we're, we're interested in exploring. And in particular, the, the under density probability function is useful. Okay, so now what if we combine all of these measurements? So now I'm starting as we go down the rainbow from WP and adding in all of the statistics. So I'm adding in the monopole, then the quadrupole, then the UPF, then the marked correlation function. So the two beyond standard ones at the end. Um, and you can see as we go down the rainbow, how our um, constraints shrink. Um, and uh, the really exciting thing is if you can see this um, sigma eight uh, posterior, the kind of cool colors are the standard statistics here. And as soon as we add in the beyond standard statistics, we kind of jump to a more precise and more accurate recovery of sigma eight. Um, now this is just on one um, recovery uh, catalog um, as a test. I'll show you statistical results more, but this is um, bodes well. Um, similarly with gamma F, we're, we're snapping on to um, an improved constraint with the beyond standard statistics. Um, HOD parameters, um, especially MSAT, we, we have a similar pattern. Um, which is that satellite scale. Um, I should explain some of these parameters a bit. I'm also showing you here the um, uh, velocity uh, bias of um, central galaxies here, that's VBC, as well as the velocity bias of satellite galaxies um, down here, which is um, greatly improved. It's interesting that that's the one we see the, the constraint most on. And then the assembly bias parameters, FN was the most important one to focus on here. It's kind of the amplitude of assembly bias, tuning it up and down. Um, de, sigma n and delta n kind of control the rest of our assembly bias model. So it's it's good to see that we also can constrain those well, but they're perhaps less important. Um, all right. Um, so as promised, we do this on um, a suite of 70 test simulations. Um, so that's seven different cosmologies with 10 HODs, unique HODs per cosmology. Um, and on this plot, um, the sigma I'm mentioning here is uh, not to be confused with sigma eight, but it's the inner 60% range of our posterior for each um, 
individual parameter. And so here I'm showing one over sigma on the y-axis. So that's the, in, uh, the inverse precision. So higher bars are gonna be more precise measurements just to, to make it more natural. Um, and these are just each of the individual statistics, what information they're bringing. Um, so you can see that the, um, kind of as expected, the projected, correl uh, projected correlation function brings in the most information. So that's good that that's what we've been using, followed closely by the, the monopole um, for most of these. Um, and then the other statistics, um, while not quite as informative on their own, do bring in significant information. Um, and we saw in the previous plots that they, in particular, bring in information when combined with each other. So let's see how that ends up happening. Oh, and the thing to look at here is um, the information above this prior line. Um, so that's kind of the bottom of the plot to be looking at. So the quadrupole does not really give us much information, especially on the combined parameter that we care a lot about, F sigma 8. Um, but it still ends up being important when we um, combine it with the others, which is on this plot. So um, as you can see, we'll get a monotonic increase as we add in statistics to our chains. Oops, sorry. Um, and in particular, you can see the increase between um, the golden bar, which is the three standard statistics, when we add in the UPF and um, MCF uh, in this total combined one in the magenta. Um, and so you can see that uh, we get an improvement on um, omega, uh, omega M and sigma eight um, of about 25% when we include the beyond standard statistics. Um, perhaps this one actually even more, like nearly 50% compared to the prior, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then for uh, our growth of structure parameter, not quite as good, maybe more like 15, 20 percent, um, but it's still really exciting that we get that much of a constraint given, you know, how um, how much work we're putting into precision cosmology these days. It seems like these statistics could be really promising. Um, and just quickly wanted to show that not only are we getting precise measurements with these beyond standard statistics, we're also getting uh, pretty accurate measurements. So here what I'm showing is the um, difference between the, the median um, parameter recovery value um, and the truth for um, kind of average over or cumulatively, um, this is a cumulative distribution function for the 70 simulations. Um, and we're divided by the uncertainty just, and that should snap everything to about a unit Gaussian, which is shown in the dotted line. Um, and all the colored lines are kind of, they correspond to the same as these um, parameter set uh, statistic sets here. So they're the um, adding in each of the statistics uh, separately. Um, and you can see that we do follow a unit Gaussian generally for most of them showing that we're um, getting pretty unbiased constraints. Um, the exception here is uh, uh, omega M, which is a bit concerning that we're um, by, we seem to be biased high um, even for just the standard statistics. Um, so that's something we're a little confused about um, and working on understanding right now. So if anyone has ideas, we're open to hearing them. Um, okay, finally, um, I wanted to discuss, um, I mentioned early on that I have a claim of um, Amulus wanting to explore the information in small scales. So I wanted to hear show um, kind of how uh, we're actually extracting the information that we are and let's figure out which scales it's coming from. So uh, this plot, um, it's gonna take a little bit to step through, but we have on the um, x-axis, the um, minimum scale in terms of megaparsecs per h, sorry, it's, that got lost. Um, and so on the very left, that is including all scales, all nine bins, which is what I've been showing you for the constraints um, uh, in the previous plot. So, so whatever this point is should correspond with the one over sigma bar I've been showing you before. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, increase the uh, minimum scale. So I'm only going to include, um, for example, for this point, um, scales above 10 megaparsecs. So this is uh, this point would be probing the um, precision we get just using the scales larger than this. Um, so as expected, as you go down in the minimum scale, you're going to get um, more information. So that's great. Um, and it increases fairly monotonically. There is some noise, um, but this is, for now, it's just a single recovery test, um, not the 70 um, average that I was showing you um, in the previous plots. So we, this should smooth out once we are able to run this with 70. Um, so uh, you can see that for all of the parameters, as we go to smaller scales, we get more information. Um, and that is true for all of the um, individual, for most of the individual uh, statistics as well as um, the combinations. 
Um, although we do see it for um, uh, gamma F and the uh, growth of structure parameter, um, WP in particular flatten out. Um, so we're actually not getting much information from most of the small scales, scale smaller than 10 megaparsecs for um, this parameter from just WP. But when we combine it with these other ones that um, you know, do end up having some more information, it just kind of is really flat because of the scale down here or the you know, Y scale, um, we see that it does actually uh, end up being really informative to go to smaller scales, or increasingly informative, I should say. Um, but we could ask, um, OK, that's great as you go down to small scales, but you're still including the larger scales in this analysis. So uh, what is actually the information coming from there? So we could play the same game um, by increasing the maximum scale. So this is I'm just showing for one of these, um, gamma F for now. Um, let's uh, increase the maximum scale. So this top point should be exactly the same as this top point here. It's all the bins. And here we should be no better than the prior, just including the first bin or not much better. Um, and then what we actually care about is kind of where these cross over, right? So if uh, I change the minimum scale here and the maximum scale here, this crossover point is going to tell us where the information from the small scale, the scale smaller than that crossing point and the scales larger than the crossing point equal out. Um, so that'll kind of tell us where if the information is coming more from small scales or more from large scales. So I've marked that crossover point with these um, vertical bars in this plot. Um, so you can see that for the magenta line here, um, half of the information is coming from scales smaller than um, this scale, which is about uh, three megaparsecs. Um, and half is coming from larger scales from three up to uh, 50 megaparsecs. Um, and so you can see for each of um, so now I'll go, go back and add those crosshairs to um, this main plot because they're, they should be the same on both plots, right? Just the crossover point. So you can now see um, what scales the information is coming from, from each of the different um, uh, statistics. So interestingly, the uh, monopole, uh, sorry, the quadrupole down here, this is telling us that we have um, most of the information coming from, uh, uh, small scales, which is really cool. So we have the same amount of information coming from scales below one megaparsec um, as compared to all the scales from one to 50. And I should say we go down to 0.1 megaparsecs down here. Um, and whereas for the uh, the pink dotted, which is the, or sorry, dashed, which is the marked correlation function, we have most of the information coming from these larger scales and then um, it flattens out. Um, so you can see for our kind of the one we care a lot about this combined parameter constraint, um, we do um, for the, uh, um, yeah, the, the fully combined constraint have about half of the information coming from scales smaller than like two megaparsecs. Um, so that's telling us that it's really important to include those scales in these analyses if we want to get that constraining power um, improved. Um, and I'll also note on this plot that I have two axes. So on the bottom is the, the log scale, which is the um, scales for most of the um, statistics, except for the uh, UPF, um, the under density probability function that I mentioned is on linear scales. So that's the top scale here. Um, and if you, you know, so it's a little bit um, funky because uh, in this combined constraint, I'm, you know, cheating a bit by including higher scales from um, the under density probability function. So in the red dotted, red dash dot, I've shown you um, with only the ones that are actually on this uh, uh, log scale. Um, and still a lot of the information is coming from the, the small scales, only very slightly less. Um, OK, um, so yeah, there's the punchline is that for um, for our combined constraint on F6 and 8, um, the, the small scales less than 2 megaparsecs contain just as much information um, in terms of the precision on this um, uh, parameter as the scales between two and 50 megaparsecs per H. Okay, um, that brings me to my summary slide. Um, so briefly, um, our Gaussian process emulators are, are quite accurate. They can predict um, uh, the standard statistics as well as some beyond standard statistics um, uh, to the one and two percent level for most of them um, at small scales, um, some up to five and 10 percent. Um, and we find that emulators for the under density probability function, um, which probes voids, as well as the marked correlation function, which probes the densities, um, add significant constraining power. So that's a 25% increase for sigma 8 and omega m, uh, and 15% increase for f sigma 8. Um, we also find, um, I showed you a bit, that the, these beyond standard statistics add um, understanding to assembly bias. So there's hope that we could um, kind of help understand um, how, exactly how much uh, the environment matters for. 
um, the Galaxy Halo connection. Um, and so the future work is to um, kind of add another point to that um, F sigma eight plot I showed you as a function of redshift and, and do this analysis on um, BOSS LRG sample to start out with and potentially DESI um, to get improved measurements on our cosmological parameters. Um, and uh, on the right is my information if you want to, to contact me ever. Um, and I will leave it there and take questions. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, a really interesting talk. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to either, um, you can say them out loud or you can just type them in the chat, either way it works. Um, so I see Chris has a question in the chat. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, so, uh, so he says, thank you, really interesting work. How do you choose the parameters of the HOD models, e.g. constrained by mean galaxy density or completely uninformed slash uniform? Yeah, so that's kind of um, work that uh, we we do kind of before all this to, to choose these parameters and um, we do fix that uh, mean density. So we kind of choose some fiducial density to fix our HOD parameters to, um, and then beyond that, do some um, kind of wide range of parameters to span the possible space because we're kind of um, more, more wealthy in, in HOD parameter space than we are with cosmology. It's really um, cheap to run, so we can, we can do a pretty wide range, but yeah, constrained by the mean density, as we said. Uh, I see also, Chen Su, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for the wonderful talk. So um, it seems to me that um, the constraints, it's, um, it's becoming more powerful when you include um, fuller information from the density field. For instance, you adopt a UPF, you're including like under density information, and then also the marked correlation function it combines both um, from over density and under density as well. Right. So um, I was wondering if you, have you uh, ever tried um, to include like velocity informations of the um, field or um, other means of including um, the information of the density field so that you can improve your constraints on, on, the, on the estimation? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so we, um, well, I guess we we do um, include velocity information in the sense that we're we're using um, redshift space. Uh, so we're we're probing the redshift space distortions, um, but we could choose statistics that are maybe more attuned to those. Um, and so you um, you could well one thing we could do is kind of play with our our weights on the marked correlation function to. Uh, um, kind of more specifically um, probe the, the scales and fields that we're interested in. Um, but other statistics that were kind of the natural extension of this, right, is to throw in other statistics um, into the mix and see if we can get increased information um, and, and be able to kind of tangle out where this information is coming from. So, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that um, I'm starting to work on is to use uh, um, a new kind of statistic that's been proposed called KNN CDFs, their um, K nearest neighbor. Uh, cumulative distribution functions. Um, and it's been shown that um, these uh, statistics kind of are really well behaved um, statistics that kind of map on to endpoint functions, but are really quick to calculate. Um, and so there's been a, a bit of previous work that I'm extending on using these um, KNNs as um, kind of the statistics for these, which I think will get us nice um, additional information about the density field. And then we, it's actually kind of, it's quite interpretable um, because it's, it's just the nearest neighbors in the density field. Um, so that's one idea. Um, and we could also do more interesting things, I think with uh, void statistics. So technically the UPF is a, it's kind of your first order void statistic, but we could do interesting things with um, void counts and things like that, which I think um, would be a really nice extension. Okay, cool, thanks. Is there any other questions from anyone else? Uh, so I had a question. Um, so we saw the bias of the Omega M. Um, I was wondering if there was any like kind of initial ideas as to what might be 
uh, causing causing that? Yeah, I think the 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 couple <clears throat> strange things are that it's only um, omega m and the other parameters look great, so it's it's not some like funky degeneracy, um, and also that this is even in <clears throat> just the the mon the projected correlation function. So it seems like it could be something with like, um, I don't know, perhaps like all of, mm, I don't, I'm a little worried to even speculate because yeah, I'm not really sure, but uh, something with um, like our cosmologies because uh, we have such a, a small sampling of cosmologies, um, just happen them happening to all be a bit um, kind of on some extreme. Um, especially when we populate them with HODs. So just kind of some um, unfortunate bias, but it does seem a little more than just unfortunate um, offset. So I guess one thing to do would be to, you know, calculate exactly how, how rare it would be to get something like this. Um, but do you have any speculation? Uh, no, I was just, yeah, it's very interesting that it's, it's just for Omega M um, yeah. is, is the... Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll update you if we have a better idea. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I don't see any more. Um, in that case, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, Kate, again, for giving a lovely talk. Um, and thank you for everybody for attending. Um, we'll have our final ECR seminar for this year, I believe in two weeks time. So I hope to see uh, a lot of you again for that. And yeah, thank you.